Tete looks deep and awkward and hanging and in. Goal! Mitrovic! What a start! Way back in 1997, an Egyptian businessman named Mohamed Al-Fayed bought Southwest London's Fulham Football Club. He paid about $9 million for it. And that was a big deal because at the time, most football clubs across Europe were largely still owned by local business people. And in the case of the German league, the Bundesliga, also owned by fans. Now flash forward through the decades to today. And many football clubs, including big winners like the UK's Manchester City and the French club Paris Saint-Germain, are owned by foreign investors from the US, China, and of course, the Gulf states. We've got hedge funds, we've got private equity, we've got billionaires. Owning a football club is kind of cool, right? It's a status thing, it's a trophy asset. Bloomberg reporters Giles Turner and Irene Garcia Perez went looking to find exactly who owns what in one of the world's most popular sports. I'm Wes Kosova. Today on The Big Take, why are so many outsiders paying big money for football clubs? And can they make any money doing it? Giles, why did you decide to do this story? What made you want to look into this? We really wanted to look at this topic in the framework of what type of investors are coming in and buying these football clubs. Uh, It seems to be odd that for a sport that's so global, the first foreign investor into European football was back in 1997 when when Fulham FC was sold to Mohamed Al-Fayed. We started to chart first in 2005, which when the Glazer family first bought Man United all the way to now, how the different types of investors have have changed in terms of, you know, who owns what football club. And this is a time at the beginning when hardly anyone had any ownership in football clubs. And then what we've seen is this steady increase first for American investors, but also Chinese and for the Middle East, you had Russian oligarchs, but also different types of investors as well. Now we've got sports groups who own chunks of lots of different types of clubs. We've got hedge funds, we've got private equity, we've got billionaires, we've got Gulf states. In the past, you know, it was just sort of your local big businessman who wanted to own this football club for a bit of local power and a bit of kudos, you know, take his friends to the game every Sunday and show off. And now it's completely changed. It's soft power, it's politics. And it's also about trying to make some money as well, hopefully at the end of it. And the line that really stuck out to me in the story was that in 2005, there were no foreign investors in the Italian, German, and Spanish leagues. And that's certainly not the case anymore. No, and it's changed for each league as well. The UK, the Premier League, that's been the one that's had the most foreign investment. And that kind of reflects, I guess, the UK attitude towards foreign investment. And the other end of the spectrum, you've got the Bundesliga, you know, that's the German league. They've been really fighting foreign investment. A lot of those clubs are owned and run by essentially fan groups who have a huge say in how these clubs are run. And as a result, they've done you know pretty well in fending off any type of investment from US or, or anywhere else. Uh, and as you say, Italy uh, and Spain, they've kind of been a little bit slower, but still some of those big clubs, especially in Italy, such as AC Milan and Inter Milan, you know, two of the arguably most famous Italian clubs, ones owned by a US investor. In Italy, uh, Milan reports that they'll be sold to the American investment firm Redbird Capital Partners for 1.2 billion euros. Ones owned by a Chinese conglomerate now. Chinese retail giant Suning has announced it's buying a 69% stake in the Italian football club Inter Milan. The deal is worth 270 million euros or 306 million US dollars. And so even in those leagues have seen a significant change in ownership in recent years. How'd you go about trying to find out the ownership of all these clubs? Because it's not always apparent, is it? Let me tell you, it's an incredible pain to do this. Okay, I thought it'd be pretty easy, but trying to find out who owns uh, or used to own, you know, an Italian football club back in 2005, people didn't actually care so much about it back then because it wasn't a topic. The same sort of people, the same sort of local investors would be owning the same football club, passing it down through families for years and years and years. So the results was far more important. Who was going to play on the Saturday? 
far more important about who owned it because you probably knew them. They're the most important person in your local town. So you knew it wasn't a topic. And also back then, if something did change, it might be a little stake here and there. It in it, as Giles says, these investors are coming from all over the world to buy up these clubs. Could you give us an idea of where they're from? Who are the biggest owners of these clubs? As Giles was mentioning, we've seen this evolution where it used to be the local uh, businessman who owned the club. And then later on, maybe 20 years ago, we started to see examples of rich men, but it was foreign rich men that were starting to come in and buy the clubs. Roman Avramovich, the Russian tycoon that had to sell the club last year after he was included in the sanctions list, in international sanctions list, because of uh, Russia's invasion on Ukraine. Roman Abramovich, the owner of Chelsea Football Club, has been sanctioned by the UK. Effectively, for Chelsea Football Club, this is a huge blow. Uh, it basically means that it can play players, but it can't engage in the transfer windows, can't buy or sell players. Um, if you're a season ticket holder, you can go to the game, but you can't buy new tickets to go to another game. So the season ticket holders can go. He bought Chelsea in the early 2000s, so he was one of the first movers in that regard. We saw that pattern repeated in other leagues as well later on, and they were coming from very different places. In Spain, we had uh, Sheikhs, we had Valencia owner, for instance, he's a Singaporean businessman. So we, we had very different backgrounds, but it was this idea of foreign wealthy individual buying into the club. And more recently, we start to see investment funds and sovereign funds. In the case of sovereign, of course, uh, it's uh, the Middle Eastern sovereign funds and with Man City and uh, Paris Saint-Germain being the two most you know, well-known examples and Newcastle more recently as well. And yes, we were seeing in, in European football high interest from investment funds on buying at least, if not a whole club, at least a stake in the club. So foreign investors are moving in to buy these teams. Why is that? It used to only be local people who were interested, and now we have a lot more interest. Why do they want these teams? The investment regional is different depending on the profile of the investor. It's not the same for a billionaire or a sovereign fund than it is for investment funds. And the reason for that is that, for instance, for billionaires or millionaires or sovereign funds, it's more about the soft power. Owning a football club is kind of cool, right? It's a status thing. It's a trophy asset. So it's a mix of that and maybe deals that you can make as a result of your ownership of of that club because i mean during the game you are meeting with other people that come to the game or come close deals with you or talk business so that's that's a good way in then for investment funds that's different because they're in the business of making money ideally and how to to make money on on football well that's still i guess the big question mark and and what everyone is trying to figure out so the reason why people want these teams i think there's three buckets it's soft power it's money or it's fun and i think the soft power we've spoken about the gulf investors for example you know you've got manchester city owned by abu dhabi paris saint germain owned by qatar Newcastle United owned by Saudi Arabia. I mean, this is all plays in, in soft power. The north of England is in areas quite deprived. The UK government has made a big effort to try and improve those areas and it's failed. It's much better when you get a foreign investor to come in and spend their own money rather than the government's money. And that's what's happened in Manchester. And that's certainly what probably will happen in, in Newcastle. After the break, how do fans feel about outsiders buying their favorite teams? Giles, when you talk about soft power, what is it that these Arab states get out of this investment? They get a lot of, I think, political kudos and also appreciation for what they're doing. Most of the times that we write about them, and you saw that with the Qatar World Cup, they got a lot of criticism for their human rights record. And a lot of the focus wasn't on the football. It was on how we see those countries being run by the people in power. 
The 2022 World Cup has kicked off in Qatar. A lavish opening ceremony was followed by the opening match between the hosts and Ecuador. It's the culmination of a 12-year build-up that's been marred by controversy over the initial bid, human rights concerns and the environmental impact. If you own some of the world's biggest and best known football clubs, you're moving that conversation away from your human rights record uh, into, first of all, simply how good is that club doing, but also what Abu Dhabi has done through the City Football Group in Manchester, spending a lot of money on the local community, redeveloping large areas of the city when the local UK authorities and, and government simply didn't want to do that and claim they didn't have the money to do that. For example, Ancoats in that area of East Manchester, as you well know, uh, was basically derelict before the purchase here by the Abu Dhabi United Football Group, now belonging to City Football Group. We're looking at 6,000 homes being built, uh, $1.3 billion of investment. And that kind of buys them a lot of goodwill. The other reason, obviously, is fun and there's plenty of very rich people who like owning sports teams you get that in the us you get that anywhere really we've also seen investment from china in football clubs is that also an example of soft power i think it's quite different from the golf investments china was far more chaotic in how it invested in football teams part of it was soft power and part of it was simply the volume of money china was making at the time but also tried to make its own league really successful as well by luring foreign players over. This is the men's league, and it failed miserably in that attempt as well. In the case of, of the Chinese, there was a time when they, as Charles was saying, they had a, a lot of money, so they went on a buying spree of foreign assets. And sometimes it was very far from what the core business of the company was, and football was no exception in, into this. And for instance, we had examples of Chinese conglomerates that were buying like stakes in, in football clubs in Spain or also in, in, in Italy. And then they failed to invest in the clubs after buying the stakes or, or taking control of the clubs. Irena Giles has mentioned the fans kind of being angry, mostly over a team that isn't performing well. But how do fans feel in general about their local team being owned by people from another country? Well, actually, I think it depends on how well the team is performing. If the team is doing well, Having all of a sudden someone else coming in and taking it over, it can face backlash. For instance, in Sevilla, a U.S. fund called 777 Partners bought a stake and tried to team up with other in local investors and have uh, control in the board. And a lot of the fans pushed back against it. That's football fans chanting, Sevilla is not for sale. And part of the reason for that is because the club was doing well, at least in European competition. So they didn't want foreign investors to take control of their much-loved club. But then in other cases, if the club is desperate because current owner is not investing money or it has been in place for some time and is not able to, say, promote a club or do changes that bring some joy to the fans, eventually the, the current owners face this opposition from fans and they tend to welcome, fans tend to welcome someone who may come over and invest in the club because at least they see it as a chance to win something or do better. Yeah, I mean, a, a bit controversial this take, maybe, but the fans don't really matter. And Arendt's right. As long as, you, as long as you win, obviously the fans love you. But even if you lose, I don't think these owners either realise or particularly care. And they're not going to ever say that publicly, right? But let's take the Glazers again. When they arrived, when they bought Manchester United in 2005, I mean, there were riots in Manchester. They went to see the club expected to be congratulated and I think they had to escape out of uh, some sort of back room because and the police turned up because you know things got so terrifying for them 20 years later they're trying to sell the club but there's a big possibility they might decide to carry on owning the club with a separate investor because two of the family members still love the club and they love coming over to watching matches and you know they have weekly briefings I understand from from the club itself about the tiniest marketing metrics 
They've got no idea there's regular protests about them, or if they do, they just don't care because they don't, they don't read the press that we read. It's about owning a club and owning something incredibly powerful. The Germans seem to be doing things in a different way with the Bundesliga. Can you describe how that works? So how the Bundesliga works is that you've got something called a 50 plus 1 rule. And what that really means is that a outside investor can't own a majority of the club. Right? The most they can own is 49%. Okay, so a lot of these clubs in Germany are actually just local sporting clubs, right? Just as so much as you, know, you go down, downtown and you've got an area that has your squash club, your, your football club and your tennis club. It just so happens that the football club is a huge organization uh, that tens of thousands of people go watch every weekend. And to keep that, what they've done is uh, they've made sure that the local fans have a say via the directors into how the club is managed and run. And they're never going to be influenced by a large outside investor coming in and buying the whole lot. There are obviously, with all these things, exceptions to the rule, but as a whole, that's how the Bundesliga is run and that's how it's managed to keep up foreign investment. When we come back, is a football club a good financial investment? We've been talking about how a company or a sovereign fund would want to buy one of these football clubs as an investment. But do they make money? Is this a good place to invest your money? That's the question that uh, everyone asks themselves before getting into clubs. There are ways, actually, to make money investing in football, but owning a, a club is not necessarily one of them or the most obvious one. But instead, for instance, giving money to the clubs in exchange of revenue on the broadcasting rights, as Sixth Street has done with, uh, for instance, Barcelona, that's a way to make money or buying a stake on on the revenues of, uh, again, the broadcasting revenues of a league like CVC has done with uh, Spain and France. That seems another way that will probably play out well. Owning a club is not particularly an easy way to make money because it's not about buying the club. It's then about investing to perform in the pitch. And again, it, that depends on the club that you're buying. If you're buying it in the second division, then maybe there's this play of investing so that it gets promoted and then selling it off to someone else willing to to buy it. But when, when you're buying a club that it's in decent shape, it's a very expensive investment because, of course, the expectation is that it's going to play European competition, not only play, but like do well enough to get at least to the, you know, semifinals, ideally. Of course, even better if it wins. But essentially, it's, it's a very, very difficult investment. That's why a lot of funds, what they're trying instead of buying just one club is buying small stakes in multiple clubs and create like a network of clubs so that the economics of that plays better for them as an investment. I think Aaron's totally right. Like football is not a lucrative investment. And I think that's a mistake investors outside of Europe make when they try and make money out of football teams. In the US, teams are mostly they're media assets, right? You've got fixed and very lucrative broadcasting income. You've got real estate and you've got brand value. I mean, they're so fixed that you can move a team from one city to the other and you can still make money from day one after you move them, which is insane. That doesn't happen in football in Europe. And I think the mistake people make when they come and invest is that these football clubs are not media assets, even though most of the income comes from broadcasting rights. And so a lot of the money comes from just doing well in a tournament after you've done well the previous year in your local league. And the time difference is huge. Your players could get injured. Who knows what could happen to your to your rivals? They could improve. You might end up struggling with relegation, which obviously isn't an issue in the US. And I think that's why, as Aaron said, the clever investors are trying to buy stakes in the actual broadcasting rights of European football leagues rather than the teams themselves. And we've seen certain investors who used to think about buying teams now terrified of doing that and only fixated on trying to get these TV rights because um, that's what the real money is. So where do you see this going? You've tracked all these teams. You've seen how foreign owners are coming in and then selling. Do you think that this trend will continue and that we're going to see more and more foreign ownership of football clubs? 
I mean, as long as they believe that someone else will come and buy it after they hold it, yes. <laughs> and ideally at a higher valuation, yes. But there are a few things that could change how things are, are working. One of them is if the leagues or UEFA gets more serious about the way sovereign funds in particular invest in these clubs. They have more capacity to sign players because they have more revenue from sponsorship, but the sponsorship is coming from another company owned also by the fund. So there are question marks around whether that's fair competition. There are also question marks around whether leagues and UF are going to get tougher uh, in terms of what kind of network you can own, because it's very clear that you cannot have stakes in two clubs playing in the same league. But then it's a bit more blurred lines, whether you can have two teams uh, or stakes in two teams, if they are minority stakes in two teams, say, playing European competition, because there's a chance they play against each other. The concept of multi clubs itself, even if your teams are not going to play against each other because of, of the implications they have on, on the transfer of, of players, it's starting to raise some questions among some of the, of the leagues. If they become tougher in that space, there's a chance it becomes less attractive for a specific bucket of investors. The problem is that investors only remember the winners. I don't think many people remember Ellis Short, who was a US private equity investor, and he was one of the first wave into UK football. And he bought Sunderland, which is this, you know, pretty small town. And he bought that in late 2008. And he spent 200 million pounds on the club. And it got relegated twice. And then he sold it for 50 million. Right? It's not a great investment. And he admits that. But you only remember the people who made millions in the Glazers. They made millions from Manchester United, and if they do sell it for the value they think it's worth, it could be worth more than the Denver Broncos. But also, Iran makes a good point about regulation. European, you know, football regulators are stuck because they want to keep European competitions as these flagship competitions that everyone wants to buy media rights to and everyone wants to come and watch. But at the same time, if it's just a race about whoever has the most money, Eventually, you get a point which has Manchester City has seemed to have worked out that if you finally get it right in how you spend this money, you can start create a footballing dynasty, much like Manchester United did 20 years ago. Uh, and that doesn't help the European authorities sell footballers this sort of meritocratic, anyone can win type of competition. Giles, Irene, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicky Bergolino. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Federica Romaniello is our producer. Our associate producer is Zenob Siddiqui. Gilda Garcia is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take.